lot of weird things go on with ass, I'm here to tell you. I'll get to that later. Hi, everybody. I'm a happy, grateful, recovering alcoholic, and my name is Teresa. And um, there, um, I heard a, a funny speaker. I don't know how many of y'all listen to speakers on tape, but there's this guy named Mark L., and um, he sort of describes my whole experience um, in a joke, and he talks about the difference between an alcoholic and addict and the codependent or Al-Anon. And he says, the, you know, the drunk hits a tree after a night of partying, and he gets out of the car and he goes, oh, i got to quit driving. <laughs> and, the al- and the addict gets out of the car and goes, what? It was not my car. <laughs> and the al goes out and chops that thing down. <laughs> um, I'm a little bit of all three, but out of respect of, um, I'm a lot of all three, actually. But out of respect for the traditions of Alcoholics Anonymous, I will stick to my um, story as it relates to alcohol. Um, I qualify myself. I was raised in AA um, in Columbia, and my sponsor always told me if you don't give your sobriety date, you must not have one. So I just tell you what it is because that's how I was raised. It's January 10th, 1987, and um, it was not my idea to stroll into an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting at the age of 24. <laughs> that was the last chance, Texaco. And um, I. I, I was not there because I woke up and thought that was going to be a good good um, play for my future. Um, a little bit, um, Alcoholics Anonymous tells me to tell you what it was like, what happened, and what it's like now. And um, I want to say thank you, first of all, for Beth for having me here. Um, for all the women who showed up, um, my posse, <laughs> it's an amazing feeling. Um, it almost makes the nervousness worth it of talking, um, but thank y'all for being here. I want to thank Primary Purpose for being here. Um, it made an impression on my young daughter who came on a Monday night um, a couple of years ago when she was um, just looking at the program. She was astonished at the number of young people here. Um, and so I'll get to, I can't tell her story, but it, it made an impression, and I want to thank this group for being here. And I also want to thank this group for taking meetings into detox, um, because being a nurse up there is not the easiest job. Um, it's not just detox. That would have been my dream job. But it's a collection of lots of people in crisis um, with a, a variety of disorders. And it's a long day, 12 hours, 14 hours. And when there's nothing like looking up and seeing two or three of y'all stroll through the day room to go take a meeting. And it's, it's like, oh, okay, <laughs> this is amazing. I'm here for a purpose. They're here for a purpose. And so we had a, um, anyway, I wanted to thank this group for being so diligent about that. Um, you mean a lot to the staff and the patients up there. Um, so what it was like. I am the oldest of five girls. Uh, We were born in a little town in South Carolina. I grew up with two fully operational cannons in my front yard. There were a series of encampments in our back pasture on weekends for various types of reenactments. I was either Betsy Ross one weekend or Betsy Ross's assistant. Um, You know, we wore the kerchiefs, the long skirts. My mom carried a flask with liquor (laughs) for the wounded on the battlefield. Um, That was one weekend. Another weekend, we'd all be in full kilt heading down to Charleston to the Scottish Games to watch my dad toss cabers and, and, you know, um, and all that stuff. Um, And, you know, then another weekend, we'd be off at a skeet shoot. Um, you know, and I was the engraver's daughter, the gunsmith's daughter, and my dad shot. And, um, and then another weekend, I was the um, boy out of the five girls because I was the tomboy. I had um, curls and freckles, and I slept in the barn, preferably. Um, I climbed out of my window to do that. Um, my mom finally figured out, you know, they, I walked in my sleep, and they panicked because I was never where I was supposed to be. And that's sort of a theme. But anyway, um, (laughs) 
So I, I, they would find me sleeping in the stall with um, Champ or, or my pony. And um, the hay, hayloft was my favorite, favorite place to play. So um, I had a best friend. Her family grew, uh, planta- they had a plantation. We lived out in the country, and um, they grew trees, you know, the big, huge trees that went to Disney World and Carowinds and stuff like that. And so there were thousands of acres. And um, it was almost like a Mark Twain kind of growing up. I would uh, leave my house, get on my horse um, before sunrise, ride over to Liz's. Sudi, their house gentleman, um, cooked bacon at night for breakfast in the morning. We'd pack our little saddlebags with bacon and take the little pet Coca-Colas, the co- co- glass Coca-Colas, and put them in our saddlebags, and we'd be gone until dark. And we would ride town after town. We'd stop at these gas stations that looked like these... Um, any of the old-fashioned gas stations, and one of us would run in and get moon pies and Cokes, and I mean, it was idyllic, and I was sort of like Charlie Brown with no parents around. Um, you know, we just kind of had the run, and you know, I lied um, right off the bat. Mom's like, you're not crossing any roads, are you? And no, no, no roads, and we got our picture taken in the um, Times and Democrat. <laughs> it showed up one weekend. And we were about four towns away, obviously. We had crossed some roads, so I got, got busted on that. But um, I say that to let you know that there was, uh, there was beauty and um, joy in my life, and I connected with nature, and I had a good friend. Um, and in her home and in my home, there was a lot of drinking. And um, there was violent drinking. And so um, Liz and I sort of just took off. And um, that was our solace. Um, I talked to my horse. You know, I cried to my horse. <laughs> he was my, um, my first um, counselor, I guess you would say. But, um, you know, uh, life was okay. I didn't really understand. We went off to camp for a month at a time and took our horses. So when I was gone, it was great. Um, going home was tough. I was outspoken and strong-willed, and um, the self-will run riot. Does any of, any of y'all recognize that? <laughs> but um, I was very uh, verbal about my thoughts about things, and um, I, I sort of uh, took on the mantle of protecting my baby sisters. And um, I was a, a tough girl, you know, and um, I was like, if you're going to hit anybody, hit me, you know, and so I got hit. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I didn't realize that um, I egged that on, you know, but there were, I saw that as a, um, I, don't, I didn't see it as being a martyr, but al has taught me maybe I was a little <laughs> bit of a martyr. <laughs> um, and so that's a um, piece of me that I've learned to look at. Um, in, in my sobriety. But anyway, fast forward, um, grew up, you know, it, it was a violent home. Um, I was outspoken. I had four uh, younger sisters. My mom was, um, they both drank heavily, and my grandmama drank heavily. I come um, from a long line of women alcoholics, and So when I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, and y'all described it as a family disease and a disease, that got my attention because I'd never heard that. All I knew is that my my mama's mama had been committed uh, for drinking sherry. My mom drank from under the kitchen sink. Under the you know she was a dainty drinker. My mom um, drank from under the kitchen sink and got really mad if I questioned her about it in the afternoons. Everything, even the St. Bernard got drunk. Um, <laughs> and, and they picked the St. Bernard as our family mascot because they had a keg around his neck. So um, I was, my, I've said this before, but my family tree was really steeped in um, alcohol. Um, the roots were heavily soaked in alcohol. So um, when I got Alcoholics Anonymous, I didn't hear y'all at first. All I did was I felt relief. I felt like there might be a solution to whatever was wrong with me. Um, I'd never heard the term <coughs> disease for alcoholism. I don't, um, so that, that was new to me. So growing up in this alcoholic home, being a lightning rod, being a change agent, <laughs> um, 
I was um, I moved out in the eleventh grade um, to, with another best friend, and I, I want to tell you this because um, you never know how you impact people, how we impact people in our daily lives. And um, this particular family that um, I lived with, my eleventh and twelfth grade um, in Orangeburg. Uh, they had Sara Lee coffee cakes on Sunday morning and drank orange juice on the deck <laughs> and went to church, you know, and the daddy was a runner. And, you know, they did nice things for people. And um, they lived on the golf course at the country club, and everybody's car was clean, and <laughs> the grass was mowed. And it, I mean, it, but they were so kind to me. Um, and the and that made an impression on me because I had grown up in chaos, um, bankruptcies, drinking, you know, gunshots off in the house. I didn't know what a clean, sane, kind home felt like, and they gave me that, and that I'm so grateful for. Um, so I began drinking at the all right, at the request of the pediatrician, according to my mom, I had a uh, little cystitis or something, and he told her to buy a six-pack of Miller Ponies or eight-pack that were little and give me one every night to flush my kidneys. Well, y'all know how that story goes. <laughs> I, drew, I was down to that refrigerator after everybody went to bed, and um, I finished off those, and then I made my way to my daddy's uh, fishing coolers because he would come home from Medistow Beach fishing, and you know we knew the beer was in there. And so that that was tenish, and um, then you know I told you I was his duck hunting buddy and all, and I was also his grilling buddy at at night on Saturday nights. So he would always give me a snort of bourbon and a piece of hoop cheese because I grill out with him. So um, drinking was. Uh, a rite of passage. It was a sign that I was um, one of the big girls, and um, and I was welcome in the clan. So that was really early on. And um, my intentional drinking, where I snuck it, started at about twelve or thirteen. And this mom, my mom, I told you, drank in the afternoon, and she had a girlfriend, and they drank, and we kind of had house parties. I didn't realize that's what was going on, but we had house parties. She'd load up all the kids in the station wagon, and we'd go to Sue Wade's house, or we'd go to um, Janice Way's house, and one place, Janice was lime, lime daiquiris, and um, the, I forgot what Sue Wade drank, but Elizabeth and I, her, Sue, Janice's daughter, were in charge of making daiquiris um, in the afternoon. And so our moms would get the top half of the blender, and we got the bottom half of the Bacardi. <laughs> and we, I mean, we were hitting that button. Um, we went through a lot of limeade and a lot of vodka and a lot of rum. Um, but, um, I mean, that's just, it was normal. It was normalized. It was normal. And um, I, didn't, I thought everybody drank like this. Uh, no clue until I moved in with the, that friend's family in the 11th grade. I did make it to college. Um, and on a hotel, restaurant, and tourism scholarship at University of South Carolina, that was my first alma, alma mater, and um, I majored in food and booze and late nights, <laughs> and I had a really good time for a long time <laughs> until it wasn't fun. Um, I could drink, I could drink with the best of them. I studied French wine because that made me sophisticated. Um, <laughs> And um, I ran a little, I, I worked for Marriott for a long time. And, you know, if you're in the hotel restaurant business and you do long, big events, you, you don't get home till 3. And really, that our crowd just partied until like 8 or 9 the next day. And then everybody went to bed, and then everybody showed back up at 3 the next afternoon to work. And, um, and I did that. I put myself through school. Um, I honestly... It is God doing for me what I could not do for myself, that I got a degree. It was not stellar, but I got it. Now, um, I, I had parking tickets I had to pay off before they sent me my diploma. Um, I thought they owed me a parking space in front of every building, but that's not how University of South Carolina saw it. So um, I, I'm so grateful that you know I got that degree, but it... it um, 
it did not make, it, I didn't want that. I wanted to own a hotel. I wanted to <laughs> be the boss. I didn't want to be bossed around. Self will run riot. Um, so I quit Marriott and I got my securities exchange license um, and I started selling private placement investments. And um, I was making some pretty good money. It was before the tax re reform happened and um, I was working on commission. And I, I got large lumps of money. And um, this is where my drinking really took off and other dry goods. And um, that, that was about 21 or 22. The, I blacked out. I was a blackout drunk um, at this point. I did not know that's what it was. I thought everybody had memory lapses when they drank. I swear to you, I had no clue. Um, that I thought everybody didn't remember what they did when they drank. Um, I, I drank and drove. Um, I had friends begging me to not drink and drive. And I, you know, I would cuss them out. I would get, I'm getting thrown out of bars at this point. I'm getting, I'm hearing people step over me on the dock at um, Lake Murray. Oh, give her another Budweiser, she'll be all right. <laughs> um, I'm hearing, um, you know, owners of restaurants say, "Get her out of here. Is she with you? Don't bring her back." Um, it was not pretty, and um, and I also had a roommate. Um, Invite them to lunch. I'm a little suspicious of lunch dates now after this. <laughs> um, two of my girlfriends invited me. Well, she was my roommate at the time. They took, told me they were going to take me to lunch, and they dropped me off at mental health. <laughs> so um, things were not going well in my life at this point. Um, I'm writing bad checks. This is back in the day when you wrote checks. And um, I swear to you with every fiber in my being, I thought my commission check was coming in that day when I wrote that check to the liquor store. I was shopping liquor stores around town. I was buying wine at different grocery stores, et cetera. And so I'm writing bad checks. Um, and I'm delusional at this point because I don't have the money to cover it. But I'm thinking that when I go to work the next morning, there's going to be a commission check there for me, just kind of magically. Um, that's the level of skewed thinking that um, I had at, at this point. Um, I'm also starting to get paranoid and hearing people and seeing things coming through my windows at night. Um, and uh, uh, this roommate who dropped me off at mental health eventually asked me to kindly find another apartment, which I did. Oh, I found a better one, one I could not afford, <laughs> but it was within walking distance of all the bars and five points, so that, that, that was pretty cool. Um, I leased a car I couldn't afford just to show her, and um, that's really when the drinking took off. Um, I was not able to pay my electricity bill, and they don't care, and they cut it off at five o'clock on Friday afternoon. <laughs> so my vodka stayed in the freezer, just in case the electricity was out, so at least it would be cold. <laughs> so um, I was very alone at this point, and um, I'm, I know that, um, like, I'm leaving blank checks at bars because I can't qualify for a credit card to run a tab. Um, it, it, it really out of control drinking. Um, and I, you know, I did not see myself as having a problem drinking. I just saw myself as needing to get good um, and do something different or find the right church or find the right address or drive the right car or date the right person. Um, and so um, it, it, it turned out that this investment company that I was working for I used to party with one of the agents down in Charleston, and he came up to Columbia for a meeting and um, invited me to dinner the night before our meeting happened. And so he comes into town, and um, I was like, yes, guys here, we can go to Goat Feathers. That was a really late-night bar um, where a lot, there were a lot went on down there. <laughs> anyway, I'll leave it at that. But if you got to Goat Feathers, you weren't going to go to bed until two days later usually. <laughs> so um, I was planning on a, a fun time and a um, guy gets there and I, um, we went out to a nice dinner and I ordered a glass of wine because I'd already had my vodka before we left because I can't drink like I want to in front of people. Um, 
And so he doesn't order anything. And um, um, and he's got this like goofy glow about him and his smile. And, um, and my wine is getting hot and it's sweating and there's a ring on the tablecloth now because it's warm. And I, I'm so stubborn. I am not going to take a drink of that wine because he's not drinking. I don't want the focus to be on me. I'd heard enough about how much I could drink from other dates. So, um, and, and bartenders and stuff. And um, so <laughs> he tells me in a real general way that he's not drinking and he hadn't had a drink in 30 days. And um, he doesn't mention AA. Um, he just says, I, I feel great, you know, I'm not drinking. Um, and um, he piqued my interest a little bit. And um, it was either before that or right after that meeting, there was a PSA on TV, and a woman just came on. It's like a 15-second thing. And I'm laid out on my sofa, fully clothed, after having passed out coming in the door. And she says, if you think alcohol is a problem, it probably is. And that was it. I'm like, damn you <laughs> and then guy comes into my life and he's not had a drink and um so these little thumps on the head these god thumps is what i call them start started happening and coming coming around um so anyway he goes to a meeting the next day he oh, well, actually we're in the office he picks up his coat off the back of his chair and um i was like are you going to, um, where are you headed? And he said, well, I'm, I'm going to a noon AA meeting. And I said, do you mind if I go? And um, he's like, no, come on. So I get in that meeting, and um, I'm going to paint a picture for y'all. All right, it was winter in Columbia. I'm selling investments. So I've got on a gray flannel suit. And uh, a couple of months prior, um, I had developed, women especially, developed these red, like blisters on their face, like blood vessels pop up when you drink. And um, a woman at the makeup counter had the audacity to ask me if I drank a lot. And <laughs> I was like, what? And um, she said, well, I have this. And she said, never mind, but to cover up those red spots, you can put this green base, like this mint colored green base on them, and then you put your makeup on top of it, and it'll cover up all the red blotches. So I went gangbusters with this stuff. And looking back, I saw pictures of myself. I look like I'm doing a uh, mind work. <laughs> so at this point, I've got, this is the big hair 80. So I've got white rain sprayed off. My hair's up to here because clo- the higher your hair, the closer you are to God. I got this green base makeup on. I got on this flannel suit. And I've not had a drink all morning. So I'm starting to sweat. <laughs> and I am sweating through this flannel suit. And we left that meeting, and I, I looked at him, I was like, well, how'd they know I was new? <laughs> <laughs> so um, anyway, so began my life. Um, and I, I had no idea. Um, my grandmama uh, gave, you know, she had gone to Milledgeville Women's Hospital. She had been committed. She had a serenity prayer plaque in her home. Um, and, um, you know, I knew that she couldn't drink, and that made it okay for me. And I knew Guy was a pretty good guy, and I knew he couldn't drink, but I wasn't ready. Um, I, I was um, buying a bunch of self help books down at the independent books. It's like the one, the country bookseller downtown, down in Five Points. And um, I was buying all these self help books. Actually, um, the Road Less Traveled was under my bed because I hadn't tried to gut my way through that. I just was trying to get good. Um, but it was under my bed, and um, I, I didn't make it through that one. But anyway, after I went to this first meeting, I go down to that bookseller, and I buy a 24-hour book. And the guy checking me out says, I see you finally found what you were looking for. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it was a pretty awesome thing to think about and, and looking back on it. But... Um, I, I did not know I had a disease. I knew something was terribly wrong with me. And I knew I could not control it. And um, I thought I was hopeless. I thought it had a name. I didn't know it had a name. I, I mean, I didn't, I didn't think there was anything like 
what was going on with me with other people. So when I got into that first meeting, I felt a sense of relief, although I didn't hear what anything anyone said really, except I knew they knew I was new. Um, <laughs> and some women um, got a hold of me, and I can't remember, I can remember one of their names because she ran a treatment center. And, um, but the rest of them are just faces. And um, they, they kept coming into my life, and they would take me to a meeting, and I detoxed at home, and um, you know, radio was playing out of the wall. I had sores all over my body come out, all over my neck. Um, I was shaking. I, I was in really nasty shape. But they fed me, and they got me to meetings. I went to three meetings a day. I went to the um, brown bag meeting. That was the noon meeting. I went to a happy hour meeting. That was a 5 o'clock meeting. And then I went to an 8 o'clock night meeting. And those women passed me off with each other um, and, and got me through that. At some point, I had a cousin come into town for some kind of conference um, at University of South Carolina. And I don't really remember her being there, but she remembers being there. And, and, and she described it to me later. And um, it was a pretty amazing, it's been a pretty amazing experience. Um, those women loved me back to life. And um, they st I, was, I like to say that I was as um, charming as a uh, rabid porcupine. <laughs> I was not nice. Um, I was fighting mad. I was mad at the world. Um, I didn't know, I didn't know what to do next. I was losing my apartment. I couldn't work. I cried all the time. Um, I would collect handkerchiefs at meetings that they would just come down the line. <laughs> um, and, um, but I, I cried my way through the first six months at least of Alcoholics Anonymous. Someone, um, this woman that I was telling y'all about that on the, um, or ran the treatment center, scholarshiped me to an outpatient program because um, I cried in all the meetings and I was disruptive mildly. <laughs> um, I went from being one kind of disruptive to another, but nonetheless, um, Margaret scholarshiped me into this outpatient program and it wasn't enough for me. And um, so, I mean, I went, and, but I was disruptive there. I, was, I had so much grief, and I think that's what I, I want to share. Um, if alcohol had continued to work for me, I would have still been drinking. But alcohol quit working. All of the pain, all of the stuff had bubbled up to the surface, and alcohol no longer covered it up. Um, and it, it didn't deaden the pain anymore. And um, I didn't have anywhere to go, and I could not not drink. So Alcoholics Anonymous um, was last chance Texaco, and I was glad, I was glad for it. So um, I, I was going to tell you all, I was having, um, uh, I guess, delusions and um, paranoia. And I had this elderly um, gentleman friend who was a friend of Martine and I, and I told him that I thought that some people were trying to climb through my windows at night. And he gave me a 38, loaded 38. This was months before, to protect myself. So at this point, um, let me paint a picture of my beautiful little apartment. <laughs> it was very nice. It was sparsely decorated. It was down in five points. I was completely alone. I just had my drink vodka in the freezer. Um, but, and people had, I had lost all my friends because I had been so, I drove drunk with them, I terrified them. I stole their clothes, I drove drunk with them, I was writing bad checks, I was not, I was being asked to leave bars, I was not fun to go out with, so um, I'm there alone. I've got um, Mozart's Requiem. <laughs> on the stereo. I'm such a cheerful little person. And, um, and I'm sleeping on this pistol because I wanted it to look like an accident because I could not not drink and I could not get better. And um, that friend of mine that I was having the Sara Lee coffee cakes with and the orange juice and her family came into Columbia too for something. And she spent the night with me and went out partying with me. And um, I passed out on my sofa and I gave her my bedroom. And I woke up to a blood curdling scream. She had found the 38. She had slept on it. Um,
So all of these things predated Guy coming into town and me going to my first AA meeting, like within the six months period. So I had plenty of reasons to say, well, if this if AA can't be as bad as all that. <laughs> I mean, y'all were the bottom of the barrel as far as I was concerned. But looking, looking at what had happened, I didn't have anywhere else to go, so why not? So anyway, um, I got... I got scholarshiped in the outpatient program. I still had this 38, and it wasn't working. And um, for those of you who do not believe in miracles, I'm going to tell you a miracle, and it is a miracle to me. Uh, my granddaddy, who I love dearly, who was as tight, you could hear his eyelids open and close, they squeaked. He... Um, he would go out and write down, he had a, a, a bank zipper bag under his little car seat, and he would write down the meter every morning on his house to make sure the electric company didn't charge him more than he should. <laughs> My granddaddy did not make long distance phone calls. <laughs> and he calls me from CNT. And he used to call me Joe. And um, I heard his voice and he said, Joe, and I couldn't talk. I could, all I did was cry. And the next morning, all of these worldly possessions I had, my granddaddy and my step-grandmama drove up from Santee and they packed all of my beautiful belongings in a five by five <laughs> storage unit. And y'all don't this like a closet. I thought I was doing so good. Um, <laughs> and, they, and Margaret, Bar Margaret B's uh, phone number was on the outpatient program. Um, information and they called her and she got me in a bed at Pinehurst Treatment Center and um, they drove me up here that day and my granddaddy put a thousand dollars down to get me in I didn't and um, I, I ended up owing Pinehurst Treatment Center and I paid them off over a series of years but I walked out of there with a ten thousand dollar bill so anyone who's hesitant about getting help for finances please do not let that stand in your way um, because they worked with me, and um, I paid it off, and I was grateful for that. But I checked in. The program under Dr. Clark was six weeks. They kept me for eight, because I'm special that way. And um, then they uh, suggested I go to a halfway house in, back in Columbia. And I'll never forget that look on my granddaddy's face. We were having lunch. You know, the family council was there and all, and I'd been, this was probably about six weeks in, and um, they said, we have a halfway house lined up for you back in Columbia. And I was like, mm, mm, no, I don't want to go to Columbia. <laughs> I'm going to go to the mountains and make baskets. <laughs> and the look on my granddaddy's face was disgust. And I'm grateful for that. I was like, I'll go. Anyway, I stayed there six to nine months. I can't remember exactly how long. I worked for Voc Rehab, half minimum wage. And I didn't even earn that. I stayed in the bathroom. I was either eating chocolate M&Ms, which will get you sober, <laughs> or crying, one of the two. But they put me in with a group of two women who took me under their wings. They were a dynamic duo. We just went to visit one of them the other day. She was at my first AA anniversary, and she's been in my life ever since that they assigned me to her. She was the state... Um, chapter secretary for Mothers Against Drunk Driving. So Sandra put me in her car and I got to go to court and I got to go hear victim statements and I got to hear a man say, I don't know who made all that mess on the front of my car after he plowed through a school um, of preschoolers. Um, I, I got to see all those things and I am grateful to the God of my understanding that he put me there. Um, the other woman was as dynamic as Sandra was, and um, they taught me what kind of lipstick to wear, what clothes looked best on me. I couldn't, I didn't know myself. I had no clue who I was because I had pretended my way through life. When I lost the freckles and the wild curly hair after I left the country, I didn't know who I was. Um, that was about 14, 13 or 14. Um, so the miracles are, my granddaddy calls, and here's my voice that night, that I get assigned to Sandra, 
and Laura, the dynamic duo. And I get to go work at um, an alcohol and drug detox center. And I get to make friends with the homeless who sleep on the slabs at the Episcopal Church. Um, and a friend and I, my first husband actually, that's how we met, he had a big red Bonneville and on Saturdays we would go buy Hardy's hamburgers and take, and they would see the Bonneville come around the corner at the Episcopal Church by the Capitol and um, they, they knew we were bringing them hamburgers so all these heads would pop up behind these headstones <laughs> and they would, Jimmy, Jimmy Plyler and the whole gang, they would all come out and um, we'd give them hamburgers. Um, it drove my mother-in-law crazy. We, we got married. It was, anybody who's thinking about getting married one year sobriety, I'm just going to come talk to me after the meeting. <laughs> it's a miracle we made it 20-something years, 25 years. But anyway, um, my mother-in-law, she was um, country, lived at the doorstep of the country club in Henderson. And, and she would say, T, what are you doing this week? And I'm like, well, I'm going to bridge club. And she would get so excited. And I would be like, no, we're going to go with Jimmy and them and get them out from under the bridges. <laughs> but she tolerated me. Um, they were very kind to me. Um, they were a sweet family. And, and um, in the big book, it talks about um, whether you have a job or no job, a family or no family. Um, and I had it marked, but I have so many things marked in here, I can't find it now. But um, this is a message to people who love people who are alcoholic struggling and the people who are struggling. Don't let someone tell you that they need a marriage or a home or a car or a job or a relationship or their bills paid off or whatever it is that they're wanting in order to get sober. Because um, that's not been my experience. As a matter of fact, it's been my experience that I've seen it almost kill people. Um, and for me, and this was another miracle, God doing for me what I could not do for myself, my family of origin, when I said I was alcoholic, they flipped out. They were, I broke the family code. <laughs> Nobody's supposed to say you're drunk. So they disowned me. And I mean, that means a lot. There was a Lincoln on blocks in the front of the yard. <laughs> Um, you know, yeah, you're really disowning me. Um, but it was painful, and I don't mean to make light of it. But they did not see me for three years. Um, they, they, made, they cut off contact with my younger sisters. They forbade them to be in touch with me. It was, and, you know, you don't disobey Dad in case you get beat. So um, the bottom line is God did for me what I could not do for myself in that situation. I fully believe if I had not stayed away and found a family in Alcoholics Anonymous that I, I, would, I, don't, I just don't see myself staying. Um, it would have been too easy to slide back. I mean, I, at one of my baby sister's weddings years later, my dad collared me and tried to pour beer down my throat. So that was God doing for me what I can't do for myself. I'm gonna fast forward because recovery is why I'm here. I have learned more about myself and relationships. In the big book, in 12 and 12, there were two things that really hit me between the eyes that made me stay. It was that we, um, we try to hide a bad motive, uh, uh, yeah, we try to hide a bad motive under a good motive. And our utter inability to form a part, true partnership with another human being. Those things rang so, too true to me. They hit me in the marrow. And, um, so, um, and the other piece is, when I did my fist steps, I've done a couple, I've come to realize that we are more alike than we are different, all of us. Um, I've, been, um, I've been so grateful to be able to have people mirror to me the things that stand in the way of my usefulness to other people. And um, I've developed a relationship with a God of my understanding that I did not believe existed, and if he did exist, I did not want a one thing to do with him. Um, if you mentioned God when I first got here, I sat on the other side of the room from you from then on. I shot hate rays at you if you were happy. Um, God forbid you say, I'm happy, joyous, and free. I wanted to go throw up. <laughs> but that's what I gave myself 
for my 25th anniversary. That's what my sponsor introduced herself as, my first sponsor in Columbia, Betty. Betty had uh, Little God's Car. It was a little black GLC, and she ran women all over Columbia, and me too, and we did a lot of service work, and for that I'm grateful. Um, it's taught me about forgiveness at a level that I cannot even describe. Having done those fist steps and um, knowing that I've been forgiven by a power greater than myself for the things that I've done and the things I've not done helps me understand um, who am I not to forgive someone else. Um, there's been a lot of uh, recovery. I've done a lot of digging. Um, I've used, I've um, thrown myself into Al-Anon in the last, couple, last 10 years uh, because I resented having to go to Al-Anon. I went to ACOA, you know, to do adult child things years ago and um, worked on some of those codependency issues like so I don't chop the tree down all the time. <laughs> you know, there is a middle ground somewhere. Um, actually, I have a funny story. My farrier came to my barn in Wilmington a couple of years ago and um, so the morning he got there, this had been a busy morning, my, um, we had castrated my newborn horse. Um, I, had, I had a huge hole in the back of my leg where my rooster the night before had spurred me, so I'd just gotten a penicillin shot or something to keep from getting sick from that because he left a huge hole in my calf. This is outside of landfall. I went into the landfall docking a box, and I'm like, I bet you've never had this one happen. <laughs> so and he got there, and just as before he got there, my ex had gone off to treatment for the third time. And <laughs> Martin has his handlebar mustache and he's got this crew cut and he's like, well, it don't pay to be a male around here, does it? <laughs> they call pack up my tools and go home. <laughs> but um, Alan has taught me that there's middle ground and um, that I need to look at myself before I look somewhere else. And um, it's taught me to be gentle, and um, it's taught me to be forgiving. Um, al has taught me to be forgiving in a way that, um, and acceptance, because I am so powerless over alcoholism. I'm powerless over people, places, and things. Uh, my daughter, her, her um, story has a lot to do with me digging in and really coming to al -Anon. and y'all saved my life again. Um, I'm so grateful for all of the things I've learned. Uh, I was laughing with someone the other day when I first started going to Al-Anon. I was like, I don't belong here. And she said, why? And I was like, well, the, one of the first meetings I went to down in Wilmington, this lady raises her hand. She says, I know I'm getting better and they, you know, because I served pie last night. And I didn't give myself the worst piece, the, the crumbly piece. And I, I was like, I am in the wrong damn place. I always give myself the best place. <laughs> I mean, back in AA. But um, I've come to realize that this is exactly where I belong, both places. Um, and I'm so grateful today. And I'm grateful that anything and everything in my life today that has any meaning is a direct result of not taking that first drink because y'all love me enough to help me not do that. And um, as far as things in Vass go, <laughs> pretty amazing things happened in the little town of Vass. Um, two years ago I moved up here, and um, well, it's almost two and a half now. And um, anyway, I found the love of my life in that little meeting in Alcoholics Anonymous. And we actually share the same sobriety date, which is totally amazing. And so we're going to have a big party in June, and we want all of y'all to come. And um, more details will come. But thank you so much for having me. Thank you for helping me stay sober. Thank you for giving my child's life back. I'll pick her up Monday from her treatment center, and she's going into a halfway house. She's got six months as of yesterday. Um, my son knows there's an answer. I thought AA had to do with cars. I really did. <laughs> I've never heard of AA. <laughs> Um, thank you so much for giving us our lives back. Thanks.